Disc 15, Men at Arms By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 17x18 And he said no, no accident, the gone killed Hammerhawk Hammerhawk. Carrot took another step forward. Crucis seemed to be in his own world now. No. The gone killed the beggar girl, too. It wasn't me. Why should I do a thing like that? Crucis took a step back, but the gun swung up towards Carrot. It looked to Vims as though it moved of its own accord, like an animal sniffing the air. Get down! Vims hissed. He reached out and tried to find his crossbow. He said the gun was jealous. Hammerhawk would have made more guns. Stop where you are! Carrot took another step. I had to kill Edward. He was a romantic, he would have got it wrong. But Ankh Morpork needs a king. The gun jerked and fired at the same moment as Carrot leapt sideways. The tunnels were brilliant with smells, mostly the acrid yellows and earthy oranges of ancient drains. And there were hardly any air currents to disturb things, the line that was Crucis snaked through the heavy air. And there was the smell of the gun, as vivid as a wound. I smelled gone in the guild, she thought, just after Crucis walked past. And Gasbode said that was all right, because the gun had been in the guild but it hadn't been fired in the guild. I smelled it because someone there had fired the thing. She splashed through the water into the big cavern and saw, with her nose, the three of them the indistinct figure that smelled of Vim's, the falling figure that was Carrot, the turning shape with the gun. And then she stopped thinking with her head and let her body take over. Wolf Muscle drove her forward and up into a leap, water droplets flying from her mane, her eyes fixed on Crucis' neck. The gun fired, four times. It didn't miss once. She hit the man heavily, knocking him backwards. Vims rose in an explosion of spray. Six shots. That's six shots. You bastard. I've got you now. Crucis turned as Vims waded towards him, and scurried towards a tunnel, throwing up more spray. Vims snatched the bow from Carrot, aimed desperately and pulled the trigger. Nothing happened. Carrot. You idiot. You never cocked the damn thing. Vims turned. Come on, man. We can't let him get away. It's Angua, Captain. What? She's dead. Carrot. Listen. Can you find the way out in this stuff? No. So come with me. I. Can't leave her here. I Corporal Carrot. Follow me. Vim's half ran, half waded through the rising water towards the tunnel that had swallowed Crucis. It was up a slope, he could feel the water dropping as he ran. Never give the quarry time to rest. He'd learned that on his first day in the watch. If you had to chase, then stay with it. Give the pursued time to stop and think and you'd go round a corner to find a sock full of sand coming the other way. The walls and ceiling were closing in. There were other tunnels here. Carrot had been right. Hundreds of people must have worked for years to build this. What Ankh-Morpork was built on was Ankh-Morpork. Vim stopped. There was no sound of splashing, and tunnel mouths all around. Then there was a flash of light, up a side tunnel. Vim scrambled towards it, and saw a pair of legs in a shaft of light from an open trap door. He launched himself at them and caught a boot just as it was disappearing into the room above. It kicked at him, and he heard Crucis hit the floor. Vims grabbed the edge of the hatchway and struggled through it. This wasn't a tunnel. It looked like a cellar. He slipped on mud and hit a wall clammy with slime. What was Ankh Morpork built on? Right. Crucis was only a few yards away scrambling and slipping up a flight of steps. There had been a door at the top but it had long ago rotted. There were more steps, 
and more rooms. Fire and flood, flood, and rebuilding. Rooms had become cellars, cellars had become foundations. It wasn't an elegant pursuit, both men slithered and fell, clambered up again, fought their way through hanging curtains of slime. Crucis had left candles here and there. They gave just enough light to make Vims wish they didn't. And then there was dry stone underfoot and this wasn't a door, but a hole knocked through a wall. And there were barrels, and sticks of furniture, ancient stuff that had been locked up and forgotten. Crucis was lying a few feet away, fighting for breath and hammering another rack of pipes into the gone. Vims managed to pull himself up onto his hands and knees, and gulped air. There was a candle wedged into the wall nearby. Got. You, he panted. Crucis tried to get to his feet, still clutching the gun. You're. Too old. To run. Vims managed. Crucis made it up upright, and lurched away. Vims thought about it. I'm too old to run, he added, and leapt. The two men rolled in the dust, the gone between them. It struck Vims much later that the last thing any man of sense would do was fight an assassin. They had concealed weapons everywhere. But Crucis wasn't going to let go of the gun. He held it grimly in both hands, trying to hit Vims with the barrel or the butt. Curiously enough, assassins learned hardly any unarmed combat. They were generally good enough at armed combat not to need it. Gentlemen bore arms, only the lower classes used their hands. I've got you, Vims panted. You're under arrest. Be under arrest, will you? But Crucis wouldn't let go. Vims didn't dare let go, the gun would be twisted out of his grip. It was pulled backwards and forwards between them in desperate, grunting concentration. The gun exploded. There was a tongue of red fire, a firework stink and a zing-zing noise from three walls. Something struck Vim's helmet and zinged away towards the ceiling. Vim stared at Crucis' contorted features. Then he lowered his head and yanked the gun hard. The assassin screamed and let go, clutching at his nose. Vim's rolled back, gun in both hands. It moved. Suddenly the stock was against his shoulder and his finger was on the trigger. You're mine. We don't need him anymore. The shock of the voice was so great that he cried out. He swore afterwards that he didn't pull the trigger. It moved of its own accord, pulling his finger with it. The gun slammed into his shoulder and a six-inch hole appeared in the wall by the assassin's head, spraying him with plaster. Vims was vaguely aware, through the red mist rising around his vision, of Crucis staggering to a door and lurching through it, slamming it behind him. All that you hate, all that is wrong I can put it right. Vims reached the door, and tried the handle. It was locked. He brought the gun around, not aware of thinking, and let the trigger pull his finger again. A large area of the door and frame became a splinter-bordered hole. Vims kicked the rest of it away and followed the gun. He was in a passageway. A dozen young men were looking at him in astonishment from half-open doors. They were all wearing black. He was inside the assassin's guild. A trainee assassin looked at Vims with his nostrils. Who are you, pray? The gun swung towards him. Vims managed to haul the barrel upwards just as it fired, and the shot took away a lot of ceiling. The law, you sons of bitches, he shouted. They stared at him. Shoot them all. Clean up the world. Shut up. Vims, a red-eyed, dust-coated, slime-dripping thing from out of the earth, glared at the quaking student. Where did Crucis go? The mist rolled around his head. His hand creaked with the effort of not firing. The young man jerked a finger urgently towards a flight of stairs. He'd been standing very close when the gun fired. Plaster dust draped him like devil's dandruff. 
The gong sped away again, dragging Vims past the boys and up the stairs, where black mud still trailed. There was another corridor there. Doors were opening. Doors closed again after the gun fired again, smashing a chandelier. The corridor gave out onto a wide landing at the top of a much more impressive flight of stairs and, opposite, a big oaken door. Vims shot the lock off, kicked at the door and then fought the gun long enough to duck. A crossbow bolt whirred over his head and hit someone, far down the corridor. Shoot him. Shoot him. Crucis was standing by his desk, feverishly trying to slot another bolt into his bow. Vims tried to silence the singing in his ears. But. Why not? Why not fire? Who was this man? He'd always wanted to make the city a cleaner place, and he might as well start here. And then people would find out what the law was. Clean up the world. Noon started. The cracked bronze bell in the teacher's guild began the chime, and had midday all to itself for at least seven clangs before the guild of Baker's clock, running fast, caught up with it. Crucis straightened up, and began to edge towards the cover of one of the stone pillars. You can't shoot me, he said, watching the gun. I know the law. And so do you. You're a guard. You can't shoot me in cold blood. Vim squinted along the barrel. It'd be so easy. The trigger tugged at his finger. A third bell began chiming. You can't just kill me. That's the law. And you're a guard, Dr. Crucis repeated. He licked his dry lips. The barrel lowered a little. Crucis almost relaxed. Yes. I am a guard. The barrel rose again, pointed at Crucis' forehead. But when the bells stop, said Vims, quietly, I won't be a guard anymore. Shoot him. Shoot him. Vims forced the butt under his arm, so that he had one hand free. We'll do it by the rules, he said. By the rules. Got to do it by the rules. Without looking down, he tugged his badge off the remains of his jacket. Even through the mud, it still had a gleam. He'd always kept it polished. When he spun it once or twice, like a coin, the copper caught the light. Crucis watched it like a cat. The bells were slackening. Most of the towers had stopped. Now there was only the sound of the gong on the Temple of Small Gods, and the bells of the Assassin's Guild which were always fashionably late. The gong stopped. Dr. Crucis put the crossbow, neatly and meticulously, on the desk beside him. There. I've put it down. Ah, said Vims. But I want to make sure you don't pick it up again. The black bell of the Assassin's Guild hammered its way to noon. And stopped. Silence slammed in like a thunderclap. The little metallic sound as Vim's badge bounced on the floor filled it from edge to edge. He raised the gun and, gently, let the tension ease out of his hand. A bell started. It was a tinny, jolly little tune, barely to be heard at all except in this pool of silence. Cling, bing, a bing, bong. But much more accurate than our glasses, water clocks and pendulums. Put down the gun, Captain, said Carrot, climbing slowly up the stairs. He held his sword in one hand, and the presentation watch in the other. Bing, bing, a bing, ding. Vims didn't move. Put it down. Put it down now, Captain. I can wait out another bell, said Vims. A bing, a bing. Can't let you do that. Captain. It'd be murder. Klong, a bing. You'll stop me, will you? Yes. Bing. Bing. Vims turned his head slightly. He killed Angua. Doesn't that mean anything to you? Bing. 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 
Bing. Carrot nodded. Yes. But personal isn't the same as important. Vims looked along his arm. The face of Dr. Crucis, mouth open in terror, pivoted on the tip of the barrel. Bing. 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 Captain Vims. Bing. Captain. Badge 177, Captain. It's never had more than dirt on it. The pounding spirit of the gone flowing up Vim's arms met the armies of sheer stone-headed Vimsness surging the other way. I should put it down, Captain. You don't need it, said Carrot, like someone speaking to a child. Vim stared at the thing in his hands. The screaming was muted now. Put that down now, Watchman. That's an order. The gun hit the floor. Vim saluted, and then realized what he was doing. He blinked at Carrot. Personal isn't the same as important, he said. Listen, Crucis said, I'm sorry about the... The girl, that was an accident, but I only wanted there's evidence. There's a Crucis was hardly paying any attention to the watchman. He pulled a leather satchel off the table and waved it at them. It's here. All of it, sire. Evidence. Edward was stupid, he thought it was all crowns and ceremony, he had no idea what he'd found. And then, last night, it was as if I'm not interested, mumbled Vims. The city needs a king. It does not need murderers, said Carrot. But and then Crucis dived for the gun and scooped it up. One moment Vims was trying to reassemble his thoughts, and the next they were fleeing to far corners of his consciousness. He was looking into the mouth of the gun. It grinned at him. Crucis slumped against the pillar, but the gun remained steady, pointing itself at Vims. It's all there, sire, he said. Everything written down. The whole thing. Birthmarks and prophecies and genealogy and everything. Even your sword. It's the sword. Really, said Carrot. May I see? Carrot lowered his sword and, to Vim's horror, walked over to the desk and pulled the bundle of documents out of the case. Crucis nodded approvingly, as if rewarding a good boy. Carrot read a page, and turned to the next one. This is interesting, he said. Exactly. But now we must remove this annoying policeman, said Crucis. Vims felt that he could see all the way along the tube, to the little slug of metal that was soon to launch itself at him. It's a shame, said Crucis, if only you had Carrot stepped in front of the gun. His arm moved in a blur. There was hardly a sound. Pray you never face a good man, Vims thought. He'll kill you with hardly a word. Crucis looked down. There was blood on his shirt. He raised a hand to the sword hilt protruding from his chest, and looked back up into Carrot's eyes. But why? You could have been and he died. The gun fell from his hands, and fired at the floor. There was silence. Carrot grasped the hilt of his sword and pulled it back. The body slumped. Vims leaned on the table and fought to get his breath back. Damn. His. Hide, he panted. Sir. He. He called you sire, he said. What was in that you're late, Captain, said Carrot. Late. Late? What do you mean? Vims fought to prevent his brain parting company with reality. You were supposed to have been married. Carrot looked at the watch, then snapped it shut and handed it to Vims. Two minutes ago. Yes, yes. But he called you sire, I heard him just a trick of the echo, I expect, Mr. Vims. A thought broke through to Vims' attention. Carrot's sword was a couple of feet long. He'd run Crucis clean through. 
but Crucis had been standing with his back to Vim's looked at the pillar. It was granite, and a foot thick. There was no cracking. There was just a blade-shaped hole, front to back. Carrot he began. And you look a mess, sir. Got to get you cleaned up. Carrot pulled the leather satchel towards him and slung it over his shoulder. Carrot sir. I order you to give no, sir. You can't order me. Because you are now, sir, no offense meant, a civilian. It's a new life. A civilian. Vims rubbed his forehead. It was all colliding in his brain now the gone, the sewers, carrot, and the fact that he'd been operating on pure adrenaline, which soon presents its bill and does not give credit. He sagged. But this is my life. Carrot. This is my job. A hot bath and a drink, sir. That's what you need, said Carrot. Do you a world of good. Let's go. Vim's gaze took in the fallen body of Crucis and, then, the gone. He went to pick it up, and stopped himself in time. Not even the wizards had something like this. One burst from a staff and they had to go and lie down. No wonder no one had destroyed it. You couldn't destroy something as perfect as this. It called out to something deep in the soul. Hold it in your hand, and you had power. More power than any bow or spear they just stored up your own muscles power, when you thought about it. But the gun gave you power from outside. You didn't use it, it used you. Crucis had probably been a good man. He'd probably listened kindly enough to Edward, and then he'd taken the gun, and he'd belonged to it as well. Captain Vims. I think we'd better get that out of here, said Carrot, reaching down. Whatever you do, don't touch it. Vims warned. Why not? It's only a device said Carrot. He picked up the gun by the barrel, regarded it for a moment, and then smashed it against the wall. Bits of metal pinwheeled away. One of a kind, he said. One of a kind is always special, my father used to say. Let's be going. He opened the door. He shut the door. There's about a hundred assassins at the bottom of the stairs, he said. How many bolts have you got for your bow, said Vims. He was still staring at the twisted gun. One. Then it's a good thing you won't have any chance to reload anyway. There was a polite knock at the door. Carrot glanced at Vims, who shrugged. He opened the door. It was Downey. He raised an empty hand. You can put down your weapons. I assure you they will not be necessary. Where is Dr. Crucis? Carrot pointed. Ah. He glanced up at the two watchmen. Would you, please, leave his body with us? We will inhume him in our crypt. Vims pointed at the body. He killed and now he is dead. And now I must ask you to leave. Downey opened the door. Assassins lined the wide stairs. There wasn't a weapon in sight. But, with assassins, there didn't need to be. At the bottom lay the body of Angua. The watchman walked down slowly, and Carrot knelt and picked it up. He nodded to Downey. Shortly we will be sending someone dot to collect the body of Dr. Crucis, he said. But I thought we had agreed that no. It must be seen that he is dead. Things must be seen. Things mustn't happen in the dark, or behind closed doors. I am afraid I cannot accede to your request, said the assassin firmly. It wasn't a request, sir. Scores of assassins watched them walk across the courtyard. The black gates were shut. No one seemed about to open them. I agree with you but perhaps you should have put that another way, said Vims. They don't look at all happy the doors shattered. 
A six-foot iron arrow passed Carrot and Vims and removed a large section of wall on the far side of the courtyard. A couple of blows removed the rest of the gates, and Detritus stepped through. He looked around at the assembled assassins, a red glow in his eyes. And growled. It dawned on the smarter assassins that there was nothing in their armory that could kill a troll. They had fine stiletto knives, but they needed sledgehammers. They had darts armed with exquisite poisons, none of which worked on a troll. No one had ever thought trolls were important enough to be assassinated. Suddenly, Detritus was very important indeed. He had Cuddy's axe in one hand and his mighty crossbow in the other. Some of the brighter assassins turned and ran for it. Some were not as bright. A couple of arrows bounced off Detritus. Their owners saw his face as he turned towards them, and dropped their bows. Detritus hefted his club. Acting Constable Detritus. The words rang out across the courtyard. Acting Constable Detritus. Attention. Detritus very slowly raised his hand. Dink. You listen to me, Acting Constable Detritus, said Carrot. If there's a heaven for watchmen, and gods I hope there is, then Acting Constable Cuddy is there right now, drunk as a bloody monkey, with a rat in one hand and a pint of bear huggers in the other, and he's looking up asterisk at us right now and he's saying. My friend Acting Constable Detritus won't forget he's a guard. Not Detritus. Asterisk to trolls, heaven is below. There was a long dangerous moment, and then another dink. Thank you. Acting Constable. You'll escort Mr. Vims to the university. Carrot looked around at the assassins. Good afternoon, gentlemen. We may be back. The three watchmen stepped over the wreckage. Vims said nothing until they were well out in the street, and then he turned to Carrot. Why did he call you if you'll excuse me, I'll take her back to the watch house. Vims looked down at Angua's corpse and felt a train of thought derail itself. Some things were too hard to think about. He wanted a nice quiet hour somewhere to put it all together. Personal isn't the same as important. What sort of person could think like that? And it dawned on him that while Ank in the past had had its share of evil rulers, and simply bad rulers, it had never yet come under the heel of a good ruler. That might be the most terrifying prospect of all. Sir, said Carrot, politely. Uh. We'll bury her up at small gods, how about that, said Vims. It's sort of a watch tradition. Yes, sir. You go off with Detritus. He's all right when you give him orders. If you don't mind, I don't think I'll be along to the wedding. You know how it is. Yes. Yes, of course. Um. Carrot. Vims blinked, to drive away suspicions that clamored for consideration. We shouldn't be too hard on Crucis. I hated the bastard like hell, so I want to be fair to him. I know what the Gon does to people. We're all the same, to the Gon. I'd have been just like him. No, Captain. You put it down. Vims smiled wanly. They call me Mr. Vims, he said. Carrot walked back to the watch house, and laid the body of Angua on the slab in the makeshift morgue. Rigor mortis was already setting in. He fetched some water and cleaned her fur as best he could. What he did next would have surprised, say, a troll or a dwarf or anyone who didn't know about the human mind's reaction to stressful circumstances. He wrote his report. He swept the main room's floor, there was a rota, and it was his turn. He had a wash. He changed his shirt, and dressed the wound on his shoulder, and cleaned his armor, rubbing with wire wool and a grated series of cloths until he could, once again, see his face in it. He heard, far off, 
Fondle's wedding march scored for monstrous organ with miscellaneous farmyard noises accompaniment. He fished out a half bottle of rum from what Sergeant Colin thought was his secure hiding place, poured himself a very small amount, and drank a toast to the sound, saying, Here's to Mr. Vims and Lady Ramkin, in a clear, sincere voice which would have severely embarrassed anyone who had heard it. There was a scratching at the door. He let Gaspode in. The little dog slunk under the table, saying nothing. Then Carrot went up to his room, and sat in his chair and looked out of the window. The afternoon wore on. The rain stopped around tea time. Lights came on, all over the city. Presently, the moon rose. The door opened. Angua entered, walking softly. Carrot turned, and smiled. I wasn't certain, he said. But I thought, well, isn't it only silver that kills them? I just had to hope. It was two days later. The rain had set in. It didn't pour, it slouched out of the grey clouds, running in rivulets through the mud. It filled the ank, which slurped once again through its underground kingdom. It poured from the mouths of gargoyles. It hit the ground so hard there was sort of a mist of ricochets. It drummed off the gravestones in the cemetery behind the Temple of Small Gods, and into the small pit dug for acting Constable Cuddy. There were always only guards at a guard's funeral, Vims told himself. Oh, sometimes there were relatives, like Lady Ramkin and Detritus Ruby here today, but you never got crowds. Perhaps Carrot was right. When you became a guard, you stopped being everything else. Although there were other people today, standing silently at the railings around the cemetery. They weren't at the funeral, but they were watching it. There was a small priest who gave the generic Philinda Seast's name here service, designed to be vaguely satisfactory to any gods who might be listening. Then Detritus lowered the coffin into the grave, and the priest threw a ceremonial handful of dirt onto the coffin, except that instead of the rattle of soil there was a very final splat. And Carrot, to Vim's surprise, made a speech. It echoed across the soggy ground to the rain-dripping trees. It was really based around the only text you could use on this occasion. He was my friend, he was one of us, he was a good copper. He was a good copper. That had got said at every guard funeral Vims had ever attended. If D probably be said even at Corporal Nobb's funeral, although everyone would have their fingers crossed behind their backs. It was what you had to say. Vim stared at the coffin. And then a strange feeling came creeping over him, as insidiously as the rain trickling down the back of his neck. It wasn't exactly a suspicion. If it stayed in his mind long enough it would be a suspicion, but right now it was only a faint tingle of a hunch. He had to ask. He'd never stop thinking about it if he didn't at least ask. So as they were walking away from the grave he said, Corporal. Yes sir. No one's found the gone, then. No, sir. Someone said you had it last. I must have put it down somewhere. You know how busy it all was. Yes. Oh, yes. I'm pretty sure I saw you carry most of it out of the guild. Must have done, sir. Yes. E.R. I hope you put it somewhere safe, then. Do you, E.R., do you think you left it somewhere safe? Behind them, the grave digger began to shovel the wet, clinging loam of ank more pork into the hole. I think I must have done, sir. Don't you? Seeing as no one has found it. I mean, we'd soon know if anyone d found it. Maybe it's all for the best, Corporal Carrot. I certainly hope so. He was a good copper. Yes, sir. Vims went for broke. And. It seemed to me, as we were carrying that little coffin. Slightly heavier. Really, 
sir? I really couldn't say I noticed. But at least he's got a proper dwarf burial. Oh, yes. I saw to that, sir, said Carrot. Asterisk the rain gurgled off the roofs of the palace. The gargoyles had taken up their stations at every corner, straining gnats and flies via their ears. Corporal Carrot shook the drops off his leather rain cape and exchanged salutes with the troll on guard. He strolled through the clerks in the outer rooms and knocked respectfully on the door of the oblong office. Come. Carrot entered, marched to the desk, saluted and stood at ease. Lord Veterinary tensed, very slightly. Oh, yes, he said. Corporal Carrot. I was expecting. Something like this. I'm sure you've come to ask me for. Something. Carrot unfolded a piece of grubby paper, and cleared his throat. Well, sir. We could do with a new dartboard. You know. For when we're off duty. The patrician blinked. It was not often that he blinked. I beg your pardon. A new dartboard, sir. It helps the men relax after their shift, sir. Veterinary recovered a little. Another one. But you had one only last year. It's the librarian, sir. Nobby lets him play and he just leans a bit and hammers the darts in with his fist. It ruins the board. Anyway, detritus threw one through it. Through the wall behind it, too. Very well. And, well, acting constable detritus needs to be let off having to pay for five holes in his breastplate. Granted. Tell him not to do it again. Yes, sir. Well, I think that's about it. Except for a new kettle. The patrician's hand moved in front of his lips. He was trying not to smile. Dear me. Another kettle as well? What happened to the old one? Oh, we still use it, sir, we still use it. But we're going to need another because of the new arrangements. I'm sorry. What new arrangements? Carrot unfolded a second, and rather larger, piece of paper. The watch to be brought up to an establishment strength of 56, the old watch houses at the river gate the Diosil Gate and the Hubwards Gate to be reopened and manned on a 24-hour basis. The patrician's smile remained, but his face seemed to pull away from it, leaving it stranded and all alone in the world. A department for, well, we haven't got a name for it yet, but for looking at clues and things like dead bodies, e.g., how long they've been dead, and to start with we'll need an alchemist and possibly a ghoul provided they promise not to take anything home and eat it a special unit using dogs, which could be very useful, and Lance Constable Angwa can deal with that since she can, um, be her own handler a lot of the time, a request here from Corporal Nobs that watchmen be allowed all the weapons they can carry, although I'd be obliged if you said no to that, a Lord Veterinary waved a hand. All right, all right, he said. I can see how this is going. And supposing I say no? There was another of those long, long pauses, wherein may be seen the possibilities of several different futures. Do you know, sir, I never even considered that you'd say no. You didn't. No, sir. I'm intrigued. Why not? It's all for the good of the city, sir. Do you know where the word policeman comes from? It means man of the city, sir. From the old word polis. Yes. I do know. The patrician looked at Carrot. He seemed to be shuffling futures in his head. Then. Yes. I accede to all the requests, except the one involving corporal knobs. And you, I think, should be promoted to captain. Yeah, yes. I agree, sir. That would be a good thing for Ankh Morpork. 
But I will not command the watch, if that's what you mean. Why not? Because I could command the watch. Because. People should do things because an officer tells them. They shouldn't do it just because Corporal Carrot says so. Just because Corporal Carrot is. Good at being obeyed. Carrot's face was carefully blank. An interesting point. But there used to be a rank, in the old days. Commander of the Watch. I suggest Samuel Vims. The patrician leaned back. Oh, yes, he said. Commander of the Watch. Of course, that became a rather unpopular job, after all that business with Lorenzo the Kind. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.